been a busy week. My mom was in the hospital for a few days, spent uh, all day Friday in Iowa City with a family from Clear Lake as uh, their daughter had surgery. And uh, there's always a lot of time to reflect in those uh, situations. And uh, it, was, it was kind of interesting. I had uh, an opportunity to, to, to visit with my mom and, uh, and some other uh, folks, my sisters uh, in Des Moines. And um, it's, it's interesting. Um, my sister was telling me that uh, she, she travels for work. And she said uh, she goes to a lot of different places, that kind of thing. And um, she was telling me how much she enjoyed uh, traveling. And I do too. Um, the, the, the problem is, is that when I travel and I don't know where I'm going, and I'm, I'm getting a lot of this here in Oskaloosa as I'm learning where everything is, um, driving around any major city with your eyes glued to a map for the first time, tourists don't, they don't see much. You, you ever had that experience? You know, it's like, anybody ever driven through Atlanta? Oh, man, are you kidding me? You better pay attention. Yeah, John's down here having a flashback. Uh, it's, it's tough. My sister told me how much she liked being in San Francisco. Anybody ever been to San Francisco? Driven through there, not a few, okay. I, I've never been there, uh, but you think about that for, for just a second. Uh, when, it, when you're not trying to make sense of the city's layout, mostly uh, all a tourist can do is, is to survive the streets. And, and San Francisco is one of those places uh, where they have uh, never ending uh, roller coaster roads. It, it, you're like a mouse in a maze. I don't know how well you can. They don't ever good. All right, well, anyway, it was a great idea. Uh, but uh, it, just absolutely a crazy community to drive in. And you would drive all over until you found what you were looking for. Maybe it's um, the Golden Gate Bridge or, or the Fisherman's Wharf or uh, even uh, Chinatown. But what if those who were traveling to San Francisco were first given an overview? So that you had some kind of a, a, a way to look down upon the city and kind of get a feel for the way that it's laid out. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that make it a little bit easier? You'd help with the illustration if you just do this. Yes, Pastor, whatever you say, yeah, okay. Um, it, it, it makes a little more logic if you can see it from above. That makes sense. And then once you're back on those city streets, perhaps then it might be easier to uh, find your way around. Now, what does that have to do with what we're, we're talking about? We are beginning today a new series in um, the book of 1 Corinthians. And, and this is one of those awkward messages for me. Because my desire is just dig in, get right in the scriptures and go. But just like driving in a big city, you need to have kind of an overview. And so before we go ripping through the streets of 1 Corinthians, what I want us to do is to get a bird's eye view of some of the twists and turns. You need to ignore the trees right now and focus on the forest. And as we do, what we're going to find out is that the city of Corinth is much like the American society that we live in today. Drunk on wealth, immorality, perhaps uh, the vice capital of the world of its day. And through the overview, what I want us to do is to be able to take Paul's message that he's going to bring. Now, understand that if you've got any uh, uh, working with 1 Corinthians, it is a book of a lot of rebukes. But can I say this? It is a book of love. 1 Corinthians is a book of love. And we're going to bring that out as we walk through there. But, but what we want to see sometimes is, like the Corinthians, we too are members of a godless society in desperate need of the transforming message of the gospel. Amen? See, sometimes we get it in our heads that as soon as we come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, we're done with the gospel. So we set it aside, and we, we save that for the unsaved folks that need it, right? Let me tell you something. If you're going to live a successful life for Jesus Christ, you need the gospel every day. Because what got you saved is what keeps you growing, keeps you changing. 
All right? And so as we walk through here, uh, that we want to see the transforming message. Yeah, there's going to be some rebukes. There's going to be some hard things to walk through. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But we also want to recognize that, that as we are studying through the book of 1 Corinthians, it is a book about changed lives and changing lives to the glory of God. And so I trust that you are uh, looking forward to that and uh, interested in that. So we're going to begin uh, this morning by simply talking a little bit about the city of Corinth. Now, so we don't get lost, let's take some time to get an overall perspective, if you will, of this ancient city. Corinth uh, was destroyed by the Romans in 146 B.C., then rebuilt by Julius Caesar a hundred years later. It was the first Roman colony, so it was largely populated by Romans and eventually became the capital of uh, the particular uh, Roman province that, that it was in, province that it was in. Uh, because of its location, it became a major trade center with a resulting cosmopolitan population made up of Greeks and Romans, businessmen, folks from the Near East, um, including many Jews. Now, here's, here's one of the keys that you need to understand. Corinth's location was key to its lavishness. You see, it sits on an isthmus between two seas. And um, travelers and traders could enter Corinth literally from any direction. They could come uh, from the sea on either side or on the land bridge uh, that they were on, and uh, uh, goods literally just poured into this community uh, it, it, from everywhere imaginable, making Corinth, if you will, the vanity fair of Greece. It was an extremely wealthy, extremely populous, extremely pluralistic city. But Corinth, however, was also a city that was the center of vice. The Corinthians worshipped many gods and goddesses, most famous being Aphrodite, a goddess of love. And literally, there were thousands of prostitutes that served in the temple during the day then went out into the streets of an evening. Corinthians Reputation, the Corinthians' reputation for immorality and promiscuity was so widespread, listen to this, that there was actually a derogatory term that people would use, and it was simply this if you were Corinthianized, if you were Corinthianized, it meant literally to be one who practiced immorality. That's the, 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 the picture of, of what we're looking at here. Now, you say, was it all bad? No, no, no. They had um, some games there as well. It was the site of the Ithmian Games, and uh, second in importance only to the Olympics. Uh, these games were held every two years, lasted several days. They had athletics, uh, equestrian events, and uh, musical competitions, and they were conducted in huge stadiums. The outdoor stadium uh, was, was able to hold uh, 18,000 people. They had an indoor arena that they used as well, held 3,000 people. But the games were not only popular because of their extravagance, but also because of the debauchery that came with it. And so understand that as we look at the city of Corinth, we look at the, the culture, we look at what was going on there, Understand that Corinth lived up to its name in every aspect of life, even this area of sports. And, uh, you know, as, as, I, I'm not going to have to go very far to draw conclusions, am I, to where we live today? It, it's, it's an amazing thing. All right, so that's a little bit about the city of Corinth. I want to talk as well about the founding of the church itself. Take your Bibles with me, if you would. Open to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18 in your Bibles. And, and understand that, that, that Paul traveled to Corinth somewhere around 51 AD. Now, he went there, and, and his zeal to spread the, the gospel was stronger than any fear that he might have had because of the reputation of that city. 
<clears throat> when he arrives, he meets two fellow Jews, <clears throat> Aquila and Priscilla, who had recently left Italy because Emperor Claudius had ordered all the Jews out of uh, that area. And you see that here in Acts chapter 2, or excuse me, yeah, Acts chapter 18 and verse 2 says he found certain Jews, Aquila and Priscilla, uh, born in Pontius and recently came from Italy uh, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. So he is drawn together with them uh, because of a couple of things. One is the Jewish heritage that they shared. Two was that they were both in the same business, if you will. They were tent makers. And so uh, they threw in together, if you will, and Paul stayed with them. He discipled them. Uh, and then the, verse 4 tells us that he also was preaching in the synagogues every Sabbath, trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. Later on in, in uh, Acts chapter 18, it says uh, that uh, Timothy and, and Silas came, uh, and uh, uh, leaving the trade, they began to concentrate on their efforts with the Jews. But the Jews didn't want to receive the message that Paul had for them. Uh, in fact, it's, it's interesting here. I believe it's in, uh, let me see if I can find it, verse 6. But they opposed him and blasphemed. So not only did they oppose him, but, but they blasphemed God. They wanted nothing to do with that. Paul, it says here, shook off his garments and said, that's it. I'm done with the Jews. I'm going to turn my attention to uh, the Gentiles. And he focuses his ministry upon them, many of whom, verses 6 through 8 tell us, believed but despite the, the success that Paul was having with the, the Gentiles there, it, it, it seemed that something wasn't quite right with him. Um, he was anxious, maybe, maybe a little bit afraid. Look at verse 9. It says this, Now the Lord spoke to Paul by night, uh, in the night, by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. You know, you think about Paul ministering in that place, and it, it, it might have been a little scary, and, uh, and we've already talked about what kind of culture it was and that kind of thing. Uh, in his mind, maybe a, a, a seed of worry took root, that the pattern of all of the things that had happened to him before would happen here again. Rejection by the Jews, progress among the Greeks, fury from the Jews, the expulsion by a violent mob or judicial process, just when the gospel was getting to take a hold. And this anxiety uh, was, was one of the strands of Paul's nature. And, and it sometimes in Paul's life got the upper hand a little bit. You, you ever been there? You know, you know you're doing what God wants you to do, but you're still just a, a little nervous, a little worried. What if? That's when the what ifs come in, amen? And, and here, maybe Paul is having a what if moment. What if he would never win another, uh, folk, another person there in Corinth to Christ? What if the spark of uh, a new life in a man's eyes was not seen again? Perhaps the dreaded physical agony of another beating, another stoning was just weighing on him. But I want you to notice the words of comfort that Jesus gives him. Okay, Look again at verse 9. And the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. He said, do not be afraid, but speak. Do not keep silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Isn't God's word incredible? I mean, when we think about the Apostle Paul many times, we, we don't think of him of, of being a, a, a shrinking violet or somebody who's anxious or, or maybe worried. And here we see that warts and all, Paul is described here as the Lord had to come to him by night in a vision and say, it's okay, don't worry, don't be afraid. Stand strong, preach the word. But you see the promise that's in there? He says, I have many people in this city. I have many people in this city. Paul, your job is to go out and find them. Bring, them. bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ. Paul stayed in Corinth for more than 18 months. It's one of the longest stays that he had in any of the churches that he started. And his heart became welded 
to the Corinthians, as he watched them come to Christ, as he, as he uh, slowly watched their faith grow, as he, they were discipled, the Lord was truly faithful to Paul in the ministry that he had here at Corinth. In the second letter of uh, Corinth, uh, the, the Corinthian church, excuse me, the second leader of the Corinthian church was a man by the name of Apollos. And, and as an eloquent Jewish convert from Alexander, Apollos came to Ephesus, began preaching while Aquila and Priscilla were there. And uh, it says in Acts chapter 18 and verse 24 that he was mighty in the scriptures. Yet there were some things that he was deficient in. And the scriptures tell us that Aquila and Priscilla came alongside him and gave him instruction, helped him to see perhaps some of the errors that he had and, and, and how he could grow and, and be more effective. And so he came and was the second pastor, if you will, of the church here at Corinth. All right, so that gives you a little idea about the city, gives you a little bit about the founding of the church. Now, I want to talk about the correspondence itself. Before moving on to any of the specifics in this letter, I first want us to get kind of a grip on some of the peripherals here, if you will. I want to start this morning with the background. This is letter that we have, uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, he mentions... In uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, that there was a previous letter. Okay? According to Paul, the Corinthian believers had misunderstood his previous letter. So take your Bibles, go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1. Okay? And uh, if you go over to, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 here just quickly. And I want to just look here at, at a couple of things. Look at verse uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I did not certainly mean uh, with sexually immoral people of this world or with the covenant or extortioners or idolaters since you would need to go out of this world. Uh, but he goes on, he's, and what he's saying here is, I wrote you a letter. This is what I want you to get here. I wrote you a letter. You've misunderstood it. I'm writing to you again. Uh, most Bible commentators believe there were probably a total of at least four letters written to the Corinthian church. And more than likely, we have two and four, or two and three. But we know, at least according to, to this passage, that there was a previous correspondence that Paul had written to them. And, and it's important for us uh, uh, to know that. Okay. Uh, another reason Paul penned uh, this letter was that there were several problems in the church that were dividing and disorienting the church. And he heard about these through uh, Chloe's household. Uh, and, and somebody had come and talked to him about that. So go back to chapter 1, if you would, and look at... Uh, Verses 10 and 11, chapter 1, 10 and 11, it says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, but that you perfectly are joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Verse 11 says, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, of those in Chloe's household, that there are several contentions among you. Okay, so here's the background. He wrote them a letter. They misinterpreted what he said. There's now divisions and factions among them, and he is going to address these issues in this particular correspondence. So that gives you a little bit of the background. Now, I want to look at the layout. The book was written, probably the letter, we call it a book, but it was a letter, actually, that was written probably somewhere around 55 AD. And 1 Corinthians has what most Bible commentators say are four main sections. There's an introduction, and that's chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, a series of rebukes for different sins, chapter 1 through chapter 6, a number of 
uh, replies to questions, that they, they must have somehow communicated uh, these questions to Paul. And so Paul begins to answer those questions. You find that in chapter 7 through chapter 16. And then at the end of chapter 16, there is a conclusion. All right? And, and so that kind of gives you a, a little bit of a layout. And, and most of you, I'm going to guess, are carrying a study Bible of some sort. And if you look at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, there'll be an outline there. And it'll be somewhat uh, close to what I just shared with you, somewhat accurate. Okay? to that. All right, so what are the problems? What are the issues? Well, uh, the church at Corinth had some serious uh, problems, and uh, one of them was uh, factionalism. Uh, they, uh, after Apollos had ministered in Corinth for some time, some of the believers developed a particular loyalty to him, and a fraction began to develop between those who were loyal to Apollos and those who were loyal to the previous pastor, Paul. And, and it's always amazing to me uh, that, that, that there was, and still others were, were like, well, you know, you guys, you know, you got your Paul group, you got Apollos, and then there were those that said, well, uh, we're followers of Cephas, who is Peter, right? So you got Apollos, you got, you got Paul, you got Cephas, and then there were the really spiritual guys, you know, and they're like, well, we just follow Jesus. <laughs> Trump that, all right? And it's, there's this huge faction going on. And, and they were, the, the apostle strongly rebukes them for that. And we're going we're gonna to walk through that because it, it's such an important thing uh, to, to understand and, and to get through that, that we're one in Christ, amen? And, and servants come. And they serve, and then they go on. And I'll just tell you right up front, I am, I'm a believer that God brings a certain man to a certain church for a certain amount of time to accomplish certain things. And when they, those certain things are done, I don't know how it is that God does it, but he, but he kind of puts an uneasiness in a preacher's spirit. And he really can't put his thumb on it, but it's time. It's time. I've had people argue with me about that. It's okay. If you don't like that particular position, that's okay. When we get to heaven, you'll find out I was right. Um, <laughs> but understand that, that this was a major problem that they had. They were, they, they were drawing up lines everywhere. You know, the one I share with you is, well, well who's your favorite preacher? You know? And, uh, and listen, I had somebody come to me one time, and, and they said, you know, we don't, we don't like your preaching, and uh, we don't like you. I don't know how they couldn't, because I'm just a lovable fuzzball, all right? But they said, we, you know, and, and, and we've got D. James Kennedy on TV, and we, we can listen to him every Sunday. We don't need you. I said, okay. I said, you, can I ask you one question before you go? Yeah, what do you got? I said, well, when you're in the hospital, and you want pastor to come and pray with you? Is D. James Kennedy going to fly out here? Well, yeah, they just, bah, that's stupid. And they walked out. Guess what? Three years later, laying in the hospital bed, I get a phone call from the hospital. So-and-so's in the hospital bed, and, and they'd like you to come pray with them. You know what I did? I went and prayed with them. Because it's the right thing to do. Amen. So maybe you're here this morning and you go, you know what, Pastor, you're okay, but I'm a Charles Stanley kind of guy. Or I'm a John MacArthur kind of guy. Or a Chuck Swindoll or, or you know, whoever else you might, you know, John, you're, you're, you're good, but you ain't no John Piper. Well, it's okay. God didn't call me to be John Piper. God called me to be me, and he called me to be your pastor. And so I'm going to do the best I can to communicate God's words effectively to you. Okay, so that's one thing they were dealing with. Now, the most serious problem that they had was uh, not in detaching themselves from the worldly ways of society around them. They are steeped, steeped in, in idolatry and, and promiscuity and all of these things. And, and, the, and the church didn't see a need to separate themselves from that. And Paul's going to address that. Some of the Christians, and when he wrote to them to, 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 uh, uh, in chapter 5 and verse 9, and, and, he, and he told them the things that he did there in that first letter, some of the Christians thought that they were not to associate with unbelievers who were immoral. Well, that's not what Paul's getting at, okay? 
One of the things that you need to do is you need to be witnessing to folks who don't know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. If they don't know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, they are unsaved. Amen? Okay? I'm not being mean. That's just scripturally true. All right? What baffles my mind is that believers, for some reason, don't want to be around unsaved people because they act unsaved. What do you expect them to do? Unsaved people act unsaved and say things and do things that, that we would look at and say, yeah, oh, that's probably not the best thing for you. But the reason they do it is they're unsaved. So understand, unsaved people do what unsaved people do. And we as believers are supposed to come alongside them and begin to share the love of Jesus Christ with them so that God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus can change them. It's not about us changing them. When I was a student at the University of Northern Iowa, Hal Miller was conducting a Bible study in one of the rooms in the dorms. And um, he had his son Tom with him. Many of you may know Tom and uh, uh, Miller. But anyway, he, um, Tom was just a little kid. And uh, while they were having a Bible study in this dorm room, uh, other guys knew that in the, and they were out in the hallway and they were cussing and swearing and kicking the door and things like that and I, Tom looked at his dad and he said dad you need to go out there and tell those guys they need to get saved you know they need to stop that that's bad behavior and he said uh, his, Tom's, or, um, Hal said no I need to go out there and share Jesus with them and allow the Holy Spirit to change them because here's the thing if you can make somebody change You've created a Pharisee. If Jesus comes into their lives, the Holy Spirit takes a permanent residence, and they are convicted from the inside out, he's created a disciple. And I don't know about you, but I want to be in the business of creating disciples, not Pharisees. Okay? Now, like many Christians today, the Corinthian believers had this great difficulty of, of, of uh, in, in not uh, mimicking and, and, and the unbelieving world and corrupt society around them. They, they had a hard time with that. The, the Corinthians got the principles of the word confused. They associated openly and, and arrogantly with, with sinful church members, and that's who Paul's talking about. When he says don't associate with them, he's not talking about the unsaved. He's talking about people in the church. People in the church that were, were living outright sinful lives. And they didn't care. Paul's going to get after them to the point where he says, not only is there sin in the church and you won't deal with it, you're proud of it. Can't have it. Paul says you can't have it. They wanted to have new life in God's kingdom on one side, and they wanted to stay in the world on the other. That's not a good recipe for spiritual growth, because it can't happen. It can't happen. They lacked, according to Paul, in chapter 1, we'll look at this next week probably, but they lacked no spiritual resource. They had great potential to do everything that they were supposed to do. So here's, here's the bottom line. The letter is filled with practical solutions to the problems in the pew. And that's what we're going to look at as we walk through here. Because the central theme of this epistle is summed up in the closing exhortation, which says, be on alert, be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. It was interesting. We were listening in the Sunday school hour about a place where uh, the men were not spiritual leaders. Welcome to America. We need men to be men. We need men to be spiritual leaders. That's what Paul's saying here. Act like men. Be strong and let everything you do be done in love. There are some strong rebukes in this, in, in, in this epistle we're going to walk through. Very strong rebukes. But I told you it's a book of love. Because the bottom line is when somebody's in sin, 
The greatest way you can show them love is by telling them the truth, or as Paul says in Ephesians 4, speak the truth in love. I hope this morning I've just whetted your appetite a little bit, and you're looking forward to our study through uh, the book of 1 Corinthians. Trust that it will be not only a challenge, but a blessing as we walk through here and see what Paul has for us, how we can apply this book to our own lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity this morning to be able to just open uh, the letter here of uh, 1 Corinthians and, and just begin with some of the background things. Father, this morning as we think this through, we recognize that we're going to touch on a lot of subjects, a lot of topics. And as we do, uh, Father, I just pray that you would help us to put your word above all else. Because when we find in Scripture that our lives do not square with the word of God, something has to change. Either we change our lives or we refuse to believe the truth of the word of God. May it never be said of us, Father, that we denied the truth of the word. So Father, together corporately right now, I'm asking every single one of us as we walk through the book of 1 Corinthians, if we find anything in there where our life does not square with the word of God, that we'll make a commitment, Father, before you to change our lives, to change our thinking, to change our attitude that it might come in line with the truth of your word. Father, you've given us your word. You, you've told us that it is everything we need for life and godliness. Father, may we constantly be checking our lives against it and constantly making changes to our lives, never to the word of God. We love you this morning, Father. We thank you for this opportunity to have opened your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your hymnals if you'd like. How firm a foundation, number uh, 275. How firm a foundation. Would you stand together with me this morning? And, and uh, as always, if there's a need in your life and, and you uh, would like to come forward and kneel down here at the front, either on the platform or the first pew and pray, you're welcome to do so. Uh, if there is a specific need you'd like somebody to pray with you, you just let me know. We'd be more than happy to have somebody go aside and open God's word with you. Number 275, how firm a foundation. I, I, as I looked at this for a closing song, I didn't know where to cut it off. So we're singing the whole thing because it's just so rich about God's word and how important it is in our lives. Let's sing this together, how firm a foundation. How firm a foundation.